So this is now chapter five of the book. Oh, let's get the book out while we're at it. What what happens now will correspond pretty closely to the, to the material in chapter five, so that you theoretically can actually find out by looking in the book what's going on, uh, which has not always been true up until now because I've been operating kind of in an exploratory make patches as you go mode, but. Um, now that the basic notions of how to make patches and figure out what they're doing should sort of be down, um, I'm going to try to be a little bit more, whatever you call it, a little, a little bit closer to the um, to the written thing in the book because that way it'll be much easier for you to make correlations between the book and what's going on in class. So nothing in the book is actually wrong. Nothing in class has been terribly wrong as far as I know either. But um, but there are, have, haven't been perfect correspondences. In fact, people who have been writing, um, have been making looping samplers for today's homework, have been looking in the book to figure out how to do the enveloping, and it, the book does it differently from how I did it in class, so that uh, you, you now know two different ways of doing enveloping, and you might not know how they're different, um, which I'm not gonna try to clear up right now because it's too weird, but, but what I do wanna do is um, start referring to stuff in the book as I go through the next few patches because it's just going to make the next thing a little easier than it would have been otherwise, I think. Book. Um, so the place we're at is, is this chapter on modulation. And I'll get to this in a second, but to talk about modulation, you have to talk or be ready to talk about spectra. So think about things as having spectra, and I'll tell you more about the, the sort of words that one uses to describe spectra in a moment, but first I will go back to the patch that I was working on just in the last 15 minutes of the class on Tuesday and go, go somewhat more into detail about what that patch is actually doing and why the sounds that it makes sound the way they do in, in a very hand-waving kind of way before I show you more quantitatively what's going on. So here, here's the patch. Uh, this is the this is the fourth patch from last class, and I just realized this morning I haven't put these patches up on the web. I'm sorry, I haven't done the comment and put it up on the web thing. So, uh, so you haven't seen these patches except in class so far. Uh, <coughs> basically, what, what happened in class was the first thing was take a microphone and, and multiply the microphone signal by an oscillator to mess up its periodicity. And then it was time to go back and explain a little bit more carefully what was going on. And so to do that, I had to make a thing that had some kind of waveform so that I could then multiply that by a sinusoid and mess it up and then show you how that, how you can think about that. Um, there are many ways of thinking about it. The, so here's the patch again, uh, cleaned up. Basically, the, the patch on the left is something that you saw in week one or two, which is um, about clipping and what it does to waveforms. So if I show you that, this is a nice clipped sinusoid. Oh, why don't I fix it so that I can clip as I please so that you can see how that's going. So for instance, if I tell it the top of the clip is going to be one, then we're, what we're doing is we're allowing the thing to go down to minus 0 0.2. Oh, that's just for, just to be clear, I'll put it at minus 0 0.2. Um, so now values are going down to minus 0.2, but, uh, but uh, all the way up to 1. And if I made this thing be minus 1, then you would see the original sinusoid that didn't get clipped. Okay. And this is an example of wave shaping. It's, it's taking a perfectly good sinusoid, or in fact some other thing, but, um, but the first thing to think about is what happens to a sinusoid when you do this to it, and putting it through some function or other. If the function were linear, were a, were a y equals mx plus b kind of function, then you would just get a sinusoid out. It would have a different offset and a different amplitude. But if you give it some kind of nonlinear function, in particular uh, the, the function that's represented by clip tilde, then out comes something that's quite different. The function that clip tilde is giving us right now, if you, if you graphed it, you would, s okay, so clip tilde puts the, um, right now it's clipping from zero to one. Oh, let's get rid of these to make it even clearer or less opaque, I hope. Clip tilde like that. If we clip from zero to one, you can think of that as a as a function with a graph, and the graph looks horizontal because for for negative inputs it's zero. From zero to one it follows the input, so it looks like y equals x, and then starting at one again it's it's uh, 
um, it's flat again at one. And so it looks like a, a ramp, uh, not a ramp, but it looks like a sloppy step function. Right. Okay. So it's, so it's not linear, and if you, um, you'll see this in gory detail later, but the basic deal is that when you put a sinusoid through a nonlinear transfer function, as we call it, then out, what comes out is not a sinusoid. And when it's not a sinusoid, then it has a spectrum that doesn't just have one partial in it. I guess that's almost a tautology. Um, so what goes, what comes out of the oscillator here is repeating itself every hundred, and, well, every hundred and tenth of a second. In other words, it's repeating 110 times a second. So since this is just a function, it doesn't have any memory in it, what comes out is doomed to repeat at exactly the same period, if, if not even less. In other words, when the oscillator gives you the same value out at two different moments in time, the function has to give out two similar values too. So if you put a periodic function in to clip, you're going to get a periodic function out with the same period. So what that means is that if you listen to the original sound, it has a pitch, low A. And when you listen to the result of clipping it, it's got the same pitch, but it's got partials. And this is a special case, actually. Uh, I, I showed this to, because it's simple, but it's got, a, um, it's got a very strong octave just because of the way it's happened to be set up. And if I do something like that, then you'll hear just basically what you heard before, except it has a different timbre, which is to say it has different partials. Okay, and this is this is basic. This is how in electronic music you make well. This is one. This is the most generally used thing in electronic music that I'm aware of for making things that have partials that uh, that have strengths that you try to control in one way or another. But in order to control them, you have to do math. In order to just do it, you just throw something in a nonlinear function at will and you get it out. The history of this is sort of that um, guitarists in the 40s and 50s started um, actually not overdriving their amps but messing up their speakers. Um, I believe the first example of, of distortion guitar was some jazz guitarist who decided to take a knife or a pencil maybe and just bash the cone of his amplifier speaker so that it would sound fuzzy. <laughs> and it works. Uh, in a, in a very loose way of speaking, what that's doing is, is making the amplifier no longer be a linear thing and, and start being a nonlinear thing. In other words, it's a thing where you put two signals in and what comes out is not the sum of what it would have been for the two signals separately. And anything that has that kind of property has the ability to introduce new frequencies into the sound that might not have been present there before. Okay, now it's time probably to start talking about spectra in a more graphy, um, graphy comprehensible way so that I can now show you something about what's actually happening. Um, actually, bef sorry, before I do that, I, I have to finish showing you, just finish reviewing or bringing back out the patch from last time because I didn't show you the other thing that you can do. So here's the thing that has partials, and here's a, a thing that has partials that is also being ring modulated. And what I did was, what I had played you before was sounds like this. Well, not quite like that. More like that. Sounds where you would take some sound in and then just destroy its periodicity by basically multiplying it by the wrong sinusoid. Um, well, wrong. Uh, a sinusoid that has a different period from the sound of the original, uh, from the original waveform that's getting graphed. But, of course, so here's, here's the waveforms that we're putting in. Here's this. Oh. What this is doing is it's taking this nice waveform and sometimes sending it through positively, sometimes sending it through negatively, and sometimes sort of going through zero when it's doing its main work. And you just get funky sound. A funky waveform like that. All right? It's artistic, right? OK. Now, of course, it would be true that if this sound happened to be periodicity, periodic with the same period that we started with, whoops, now 
still an interesting waveform, but now the waveform looks periodic. And in fact, it has the same period as the sound that we just modulated. Way different waveform, but same period. Or to listen to them, here's what we just modulated. Sorry, that's the, that's this, that's the signal that was the sinusoid clipped, and here's the same thing ring modulated. So now you can imagine taking, oh, I didn't tell you the rest. Uh, okay, so now let's try 660. Well, okay, one, let's leave it on and try different multiples of 110. show you that and then turn it off for a second. Okay, now we've got something that, hmm, still got the same period. It, it can't help but have the same period because both of these things, um, although this thing has six periods or six cycles within the same period of time, which is one one hundred tenth of a second, it's still true that after a hundred tenth of a second it's come back to where it was. It just happens to be the sixth time it's done that. Right? So it's still true that every one hundred tenth of a second, which is about this length, both the clipped oscillator here and this oscillator, which I'm multiplying by, that's the ring modulating oscillator, both of those have, um, have come back to where they were before, and so we still have no choice but to have a signal which is periodic, well, a signal which repeats every 110th of a second, which, except for in special cases, will have, whoops, will have the same pitch as the original that we started with. So there's the sinusoid. Here's the clipped sinusoid, whoops, sorry. And here's the clipped sinusoid times ring modulation. Okay. When you learn how to do this, or when you learn how to think about this, you can make literally almost anything that you want. Uh, there, are, there are all sorts of tricks to, well, mental tricks to trying to figure out what you would do in terms of what kinds of functions and what kinds of things to multiply to get specific kinds of effects. And so first off, the, uh, first off, I want to show you more theoretical aspects of just what's happening to the sound and, uh, from the point of view of the spectrum. And then I'll go through and start working on actually building spectra according to desiderata out of this, out of this toolbox. And that's the subjects, or those are the subjects of chapters five and six of the book. Probably this will take a couple of weeks. Okay, so the first thing that we need in order to be able to discuss this intelligently is to be able to look at spectra of signals. And I'm going to just ask you to take a certain thing for granted, which is that you can measure the spectrum of a signal and, and graph it. Uh, what I can do is, is make a sort of definition of what the spectrum of the signal is. Let's see, where is my, there. And I'm going to ride roughshod over some of the details here. This patch is um, in audio examples, and this is the first patch in chapter five. This is a patch that says, sorry, but we have to introduce spectra. When, you, when it's time to actually measure the spectra of things using a patch and understand how that thing is being done, that's <coughs> chapter nine of the book. So what we're doing is we're borrowing results from the future in order just to be able to see spectra. Um, and what do spectra look like? Okay, so, so signals have waveforms and signals have spectra. And what I've done here is just made a very simple additive synthesis instrument that does this. Oh, yeah. Okay. This, okay, so what's happening is there's a fundamental, actually what that is is, it, oh, how do I do that? Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a frequency coming in here. It's, it's a, just a standard receive. And we're multiplying this frequency by the number zero through five. Why is zero for completeness sake and in order to explain a very strange thing about the spectra of sinusoids that I can't hide from you. I just have to explain it. So I'm going to come out with it right at, right at the beginning. Um, and so the ones that you can hear are fundamental, octave, and so on like that, right? Okay, and now what we can do in this patch anyway is we can start graphing the spectra and the waveforms of these things. So here's the fundamental. It has a waveform, which is just a sinusoid at the appropriate frequency. And it has a spectrum, which one graphs 
I mean, there are various ways that you can do this, but one can graph it in terms of the partial numbers, that's to say the multiple of whatever the fundamental frequency is that we're playing at. Now, yeah, I don't know what order to tell you this in. So let's, so let me just make another spectrum and play it for you, or show it to you. Here now I've turned the first, second, and third, and fourth harmonics on, okay, and so on like that. Now here's the funny part. I'm going to turn this partial on that doesn't have any sound because it's just constant, because it has a frequency of zero, and it has a spec, well, it, it adds something to the spectrum too. Oh, by the way, my computer is gagging right now, but just let it gag. Uh, and now there's a weird thing that will basically just kind of bite you once in a while when you're trying to do something and, and something comes out wrong. Um, a sinusoid that happens to have a frequency of zero, you can assign it a, uh, a strength in the spectrum, but the most correct way to assign its strength is to give it a strength of one as opposed to one half for the other sinusoids. That's to say sinusoids of non-zero frequency. Chapter 8 will explain why <laughs> for the first time. The, uh, I'll tell you what it is for those of you who like mathematics or know about mathematics. Uh, sinusoids actually have two frequencies in them, one positive and one negative. They don't act like quantum theory where all the frequencies are positive. They can, um, they, they can be real valued, and the only way you can have a real valued sinusoid is to have positive and negative frequencies of equal strengths and negative um, equal strengths, talk about the phases later, and negative frequencies. So really, although I don't show it on this table, this oscillator uh, has a peak at frequency one, and a, a relative frequency one, and a peak at relative frequency minus one. You can't perceive it, but it's there. And the reason this is double is because here, those two peaks coincide. All right. Um, for those of you who've gone into se as far as maybe second semester calculus, sine of omega t is e to the i omega t plus e to the minus i omega t all over two. In other words, a sinusoid has two complex exponentials and each of them has an amplitude of one half. All right. So if you don't want to know the equation, here's what it looks like. <laughs> This is the truth. And there's no possible way that, you, well, you can, you can sort of pretend it's not true by saying, oh, it's just frequency zero and we'll just make it the same height. But all of the stuff that we try to do later will be wrong if we do that. Because DC does come crawling into signals, and if you don't account for it correctly, you will get wrong answers. All right. So this is the, so that's the thing about the spectra of sinusoids. Oh, yeah, while we're, while we're here, this is worth looking at. Um, when you turn all the partials on, you get a wonderful thing which is called a pulse train, or Joe will correct me if I'm wrong, I believe this is the Dirichlet kernel. It's a collection of sinusoids, all of which have e equal strengths, from, except that this one is double because of funny stuff. Uh, but anyway, this is just DC, which is just talking about the height of the thing, um, the DC amount of the thing, which we could make arguments about. Uh, the more partials we put in, the more close this will become to a perfect pulse train. And it, uh, engineers will actually talk about infinitely thin pulses, which consist of all the possible harmonics. You wouldn't do that in computer music, because some of them would have higher frequencies than the Nyquist frequency, and they would fold over, and you would have trouble. So you don't make pure pulse trains in computer music. You try to make band-limited pulse trains, that's to say pulse trains that only go out to a certain number of partials uh, in order to get, in order to be, have your computer be able to deal with it. And this is what those pulse trains look like. All right. Oh, I'll turn a couple off so that you can see the progression. Here's uh, a pulse train with three partials, actually zero, one, and two. And then the more partials you throw on of, of equal strength, the skinnier and taller the peak gets and the more wiggles, ripples, the engineers will call that, you will see between pulses. 
All right. So that's pulse trains. That's just a qualitative thing to know about because you will see pulse trains again in the future. Okay. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is to be able to tell you what happens when you do things like apply a nonlinear function to a sinusoid or multiply some complicated spectrum by a sinusoid. Now, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is, yeah, I'll, do that. I'll, I'll stick to the, I'll stick to these, and then I'll start telling you more of the whole truth later. I'm going to save this. You probably can't do this, but if you're actually writing the thing, you can save your own help files. Uh, let's see. Help. Browse. And data. Audio examples. Now we're going to look at E02. Ring modulation. Now what I'm going to do is make a nice spectrum or uh, spectrum knowledgeable. Is that the right word? Uh, uh, what do we say? Pep speech about ring modulation. So here now what's happening is the following. We're going to go back and we're going to look at uh, our nice bunch of sinusoids that has a nice spectrum like this. Oh, yeah. And I can actually ask this one to repeat, repeat graph repeatedly, which is on a metronome so that I can change things live. Good. Okay. This is idiot's delight now, right? You can make funny spectrum look at their at their waveforms and spectrum. Now, what we're going to do, gee whiz, we're going to multiply this thing by an oscillator. And the oscillator is going to have a frequency and I'm, I'm cheating a little bit about the frequencies here because to make it very easy to analyze, I'm choosing a frequency that's a sub-multiple of the sample rate. So I'm not going to talk about exactly what the frequency's values are, just relatively. So if I say in f over 16, if this is the frequency f, if I say, oh, can we hear this? Let's listen to it. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. All right. We'll do it. If I say, well, let's make this thing be eight. Look at, oh, wait, no, no, wait. Let me do this. Okay, now we have a sinusoid, and now we're going to start multiplying it by an oscillator. And as you know, what that does is that splits the sound up into two frequencies because that's what ring modulation does to sinusoids, as, as described last time. One way of thinking of that is. Um, beating is the same thing as having two neighboring sinusoids. It's a mathematical formula, but it also means that if someone gives you this and says, why don't you give me, give me two of those and make them be split in frequency, you just multiply by a sinusoid that has non-zero frequency and you get that. All right. Oh, and by the way, now you see why it starts to make sense to talk about negative and positive frequencies. Because in fact, this thing has negative and positive frequencies in it, and that is why this peak that you saw split into two peaks. It's because the negative frequency of one by multiplying with it dropped the frequency and the positive one added to the frequency. And furthermore, when I set that frequency to zero, the two collide, and then I get that. Uh, yeah, now I'm, I'm playing tricks with phase here. If I do something like make these two beat against each other. Is this going to work? Yeah. I just asked this thing to be one hundredth, one one hundredth. And now we have the two things beating very slowly. And what you really have, and what you have is from one point of view two side bands that are separated, but from another point of view you have an amplitude that's changing. In fact, now I can say, multiply it by an oscillator frequency zero, but I no longer have the good situation where these two add up. They add up wrong. Why did that happen? Actually, there are two reasons why that happened. This is sometimes called interference. This is an interference effect from one point of view. These two things have have phases such that, or yeah, phases such that when we combine them, whoops, depending on when you do it, <laughs> uh -uh. depending on exactly when you combine them, they might have different relative phases. 
and then when they add up, they won't add up to twice the amplitude, they'll add up just to some amplitude or other, which might be anywhere from zero to twice, depending on whether they interfere constructively or destructively. Yeah? You said the steps are at order 16. What is the 16? Uh, that's just my pedagogical choice of a decent step to use. Uh, well, so the patch is computing this thing called frequency step, and it's actually setting that to fundamental over 16. And that's hidden in some sub patch, probably in here. And the only reason I did that was just so that when you go into the patch and start mousing on it, you get decent range. It's, there's nothing special about 16. All right, now how could I actually make this thing behave itself? <laughs> Maybe I just can't now. Um, okay, good. So I just tried again and got a better, better match, so we can now pretend that things in phase again. All right. So then it follows that if you had a few other sinusoids, here's, here's, here's why I use 16, so that you can see the original spectrum and you could also see the splitting and they would appear on the same picture in, with reasonable spacings. Now I'll say, let's make the frequency step be 1 16th again. Well, oh, 2 16ths. And now what we've done is we've taken each of those three peaks and split them separately into side bands. Okay, let me shut this up for a second and talk about that. Um, this process, if you think of this as a function of what goes in, so a signal goes in and a signal goes out, and so, that, and so what's happening is it's some kind of function. That's in a loose way of speaking. It's a linear function. In fact, it's nothing but times tilde, but it's times tilde times a signal, not, by a, not times a scalar, times a, a thing that's changing in time. That's a linear operation. What that implies, yeah, it, it implies many things, but for right now, what that implies is that if you took two signals in, or here, three signals in and added them up, oh yeah, I didn't tell you this, did I? If you hook a bunch of signals into a single inlet, it, it, they are added automatically. I think I mentioned that at one point, but maybe it's a good moment to say it again. So this is now multiplying the sum of these things by this original oscillator. Okay, now I'm talking about linearity. One good thing about linearity is that, uh, that is, in this case, given to us by the distributive principle. If you, uh, if you call this thing, I don't know what, call these things A, B, C, and F here, then F times A plus B plus C is the same thing as F times A plus F times B plus F times C. That's the distributive rule. And what that is saying here is that if you take two or three signals and superpose them, that's to say add them, and then multiply them by this modulating oscillator, you get, as a, as a result, the sum of what you would have gotten putting them in individually. This was not to be taken for granted. So here what happened, what you saw was that we had, oh, I turned it off. We, we had originally this signal going in, and if we multiply by an oscillator frequency zero, we'll see at least a multiple of that coming out. And it turns out that, although it didn't have to be true, the result of ring modulating this is the sum of the result of ring modulating the individual ones. Okay, examples of things that are linear in this way, obviously, well, multiplication, that's, that's what we're doing here, although we're multiplying by something that's, that's not constant in time. And the other example that you'll see later is filters. Uh, filters are things which change, well, I, I introduced a filter quickly, but I haven't told you about filters in detail. But filters also are, at least in their usual form, in, in a, um, are things that are linear in the sense that you put two signals in and you will get out the sum of what you put in individually. Um, you also are allowed to, 
yeah. as a detail. Also, uh, any kind of linear function like this, you can multiply the input by some constant. For instance, double the input or multiply the input by i or anything else that you want. And what comes out will be that, that many times stronger or weaker than the signal went in too. In other words, uh, linear things uh, respect changes in amplitude and, and give you the same relative changes in amplitude on output. That's not, in general, that's not true of nonlinear things. What's a nonlinear thing you've seen very recently? Yeah, the wave shaping example, this clip. Uh, oh, where did I put it? <laughs> this clip tilde operation was nonlinear, and the and as a result, let's see, as a result, well, one thing that happened about that was that the oscillator that you put in, I haven't said enough to explain this well yet, the oscillator that you put in, if you change its amplitude, it will not just change the amplitude of the output and give you the same thing louder. It will give you, the, the, it will give you a different signal altogether. Okay, so I'll go back and belabor that point with you in a few minutes. Okay, so, so this is ring modulation and, oh right, special case again, what happens when we pull the, the zero frequency signal in? So now we have the same thing as we had before except I threw in frequency zero which has double amplitude and now when I start modulating that, it does the correct thing, which is again, it gives me two sidebands, each of which has half the strength. But of course, the original was twice as high. And also, this one we only see one of because the other one is negative frequency. All right, and it's even worse than that because, yeah, this is hard to see very well. But as I start pushing the frequency of modulation up, oops, oh yeah. Funny thing happens when you hit a half, so eight. Now what's happening is the original signal had peaks, ooh, had peaks here, 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 and here. A half of the, okay, so, so there's a, oops, oh. I pulled the table over, but I didn't pull the labels over. It might be useful later. It's like that. Okay. So if I modulate it, that's to say multiply by an oscillator of half the frequency, this thing gets a sideband that's halfway up here, and this one gets a sideband that's halfway down, and those two will collide. And when they do, they will superpose, and furthermore, depending on the phase, they will sometimes superpose into something stronger and sometimes superpose into something weaker. Okay. And now the next funny thing is, let me turn DC off. Actually, let me just have one of them again. Okay, so here's the, here's a nice original signal. Oops, I didn't do that right. This is more like this. Sorry. Okay, so now we'll start pushing the frequency up, then we'll split the we'll split into two partials again. And as we keep going up, what's gonna happen when we hit zero? Well, we're gonna keep going, but we have a doppelganger who's going to come back the other way. So what you saw, if you just sort of think of things in terms of characters, is this peak just bounced off of, of, of the vertical axis. What happened mathematically might better be described as, you don't see the negative frequencies, but there's, a, there's also a peak here and a peak there. And this peak kept on charging toward the negative as they were getting split further and further, but the one that was already negative charged back the other way and turned positive. And as a special case, Right when I ask the thing to, to modulate it so that it goes to zero frequency. Oh, I didn't do it right. Oh, yeah. That's a 32. 
then we get a different strength again because now we have two peaks again the negative and the positive frequency peak coincide and now we get another situation where the phase is controlling how the two add and so here again depending on the phase we, we'll get one or another strength oh dig I almost got it turned off and that's just what that is if you want to control that exactly, you have to control exactly the phases of, of the relative phases of the two things that you're multiplying. All right. Questions about that? So in general, ring modulation, so modulation, ring modulation, Sometimes people use to mean multiplication by any old thing, but ring modulation in the, in the simplest sense of multiplying by an oscillator that's putting out a sinusoid. What it does, if you give it a spectrum that just it can be described as a bunch of peaks, is it takes each peak and splits them. And furthermore, as the peaks go further and further away from the original, sometimes they bounce off, the, uh, off of zero frequency. And Meanwhile, when any two peaks coincide, they coincide, but they don't necessarily add amplitudes. They do something bound only by the triangle inequality. All right. So to make you the nice full picture, here's there's kind of a typical ring modulation output spectrum. And if you wanted to really go into it, this, this is several... Uh, this is what two and change times the fundamental frequency, and so the DC peak got thrown all the way out here, and meanwhile all the other peaks got sort of scattered around in that particular way. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah, negative frequencies. In general, what ends up happening, everything for technical reasons ends up being symmetrical about the, the, about the frequency zero, so that any time you make a negative frequency, you hear it as a positive frequency. So the general rule is that the frequencies you hear here are the frequencies that went in plus this frequency and minus this frequency, except that when you, make, except when you compute the frequency minus that frequency, if, if that's a negative result, flip it around to positive, take the absolute value of it to predict what you will get. Okay. Now I want to talk taxonomically about spectra a little bit more so that I can have more terms to tell you more quanti qualitatively what, uh, what sorts of things you can get out of this. Now this is all still just what happens when you multiply a signal by a sinusoid. So one thing that your ears told you was that uh, here, when we multiplied by this sinusoid, oh, uh, I think I have to uh, just turn this all off. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get rid of this all together, but let's see. Okay, so what happened here was when I told it to multiply by a decently low frequency sinusoid, and by the way, I chose, I chose the same frequency as the frequency of the thing I'm modulating by, then I get something like that in waveform, and I get something that, oops, it's, uh, I can't show you the spectrum of this in this patch right now, but it sounds not terribly different from the original sound, which is something like this. But as the frequency goes up, the sidebands are getting pushed further and further out. And furthermore, the sidebands that are negative are getting pushed further and further out because they're wrapping around. And that, and, and that becomes more and more true as you go up so that you get sort of a knot of frequencies that gets higher and higher. Unfortunately, you can't just use this in its current state to make a nice uh, sweeping, frequent, uh, sweeping filter kind of effect because if I slide this from 660 down to 550, It was harmonic at the outset, and it's harmonic at the end, but it goes through a whole bunch of inharmonic results intermediate. You would have to do something smarter if you wanted them to be able to make continuous changes through, uh, between these. Okay. All right. 
Now, to show you something about how you could predict that, I have to go make more pictures. But these, but it, now it's better to show pictures that are just dead pictures in the book as opposed to this live demonstration scene. So here, first off, um, talking about spectra, I've been using some terms um, without defining them and other terms I want to define right now. Uh, the, in general, a spectrum, a spectrum, at least for our purposes, is going to be um, a description of how strong the frequency content or how strong a sound is at all the possible frequencies. This is what a um, this is something that you could talk about at, at, um, for a sound or for light. This is a, a representation that ignores time. So right now we're just going to sort of pussyfoot over the fact that time is changing and this spectrum could be changing in time, which is not a mathematically correct thing to talk about, but which is in fact the thing that you have to talk about when you're talking about sounds because they do change in time. So we're just going to forget about that for now and deal with that a little bit later. Or maybe we'll let Tom Irv deal with that in Music 172. I'm not sure. Um, so the the basic deal is that spectra consist of a description of how loud the various frequencies are that make up a sound. But there's a more fundamental distinction, which is, is the sound to be regarded as being made up of, 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 dis, uh, of a discrete set of frequencies? Or in fact, is it a continuous? frequency thing like white light or like noise. So in sound land, uh, you can make, you can, by, by either uh, playing a stringed instrument or, or whacking a bell, you can make things that have, um, what do you say, that, that have perhaps an infinite but at least a countable collection of frequencies in them. And if you restrict yourself to the Nyquist frequency, there will be a finite set of them. Or you can have something like noise, which I haven't told you much about yet, but noise could be better described as consisting of a, of a solid mass of, of, of sound at all frequencies. And the, the distinction there is between uh, a discrete spectrum like these two and a continuous spectrum like this. This, is, this looks like a dense discrete one, but I'm trying to describe it continuous one there. I haven't even shown you how to make noise yet, but just type noise tilled into an object and you'll get noise, but you won't be able to do much with it yet. Um, so noise is available. No noisy sounds, which are also sounds that you would get just by um, regular operations like this, are sounds that you can't describe as being objects that have fixed set of vibrational modes that, that sit there and vibrate and you can listen to them. For some deep reason, your ear loves things that uh, vibrate in modes and is built in order and is built to be able to separate sounds that are that are distinguished by the fact that they have different modes of vibration in them. Um, you can argue about why that would be, but it might be it might have something to do with being able to hear people speak, because there are modes of vibration that you set up in your throat when your throat makes noise, and you can use that modality to hear someone speaking over a background of noise. Your ear has been very well developed to do that, and that hearing facility that. I think was probably originally for, for listening to voices, turns out to be what makes music possible as well. Music in the sense of things that have pitches. All right. So continuous noisy spectra are things that aren't described that way, aren't described as things that just have modes that vibrate, but rather things that generate sound because of heat or whatever, uh, some kind of, of random motion as opposed to a vibrational motion. I'm waving my hands pretty both metaphorically and physically here. Okay. So that's the difference between a discrete spectrum and a continuous spectrum. And those two terms are, are those are not exactly accurate uses of mathematical terms. Uh, if you happen to have a discrete spectrum like this, oh, whether you have a discrete or a continuous spectrum, you always have, you know, you can always pretend that you have a thing which is called the spectral envelope which is a, an imaginary curve that you draw over the spectrum to describe the sort of what the spectrum looks like as a shape, as opposed to, as opposed to what? Well, OK, so the spectral envelope is this line here, or this, whatever you say, this curve here that, that I drew, which actually is the same curve for all three of these examples. The envelope is, in some sense, a, uh, an idealized uh, description of what the spectrum looks like shapishly as opposed to 
in, in the details of where the frequencies are. So to, to speak very loosely, the spectral envelope is in some ways related to the timbre of the sound in a way that's independent of the positioning of these frequencies which are the, the frequency components which make the sound up, which could be discrete or continuous. So this would sound noisy and this would sound pitched. And this would sound, oh yeah, right. Next thing, if you have a discrete spectrum, that's to say a spectrum that uh, can be said to be consisting of a bunch of, of different frequencies that you could just write out, that they'd be finite up to a finite frequency. Um, then you can say, is it a harmonic or an inharmonic spectrum? What that is saying is, are the frequencies that we see multiples of a fundamental frequency? Uh, furthermore, okay, these terms are loose because we're talking psychoacoustics here uh, in some ways. But uh, for something to be harmonic, it really should have, its frequency should be multiples of a, of a thing that you can hear as a pitch, which means maybe above 50-ish hertz and below... 4,000-ish hertz. That's hand wavy too, because you can hear pitches down to 25 and 30 hertz, but it gets harder. Um, if it is true that all the frequencies that you see are multiples of some fundamental that looks somewhere between 50-ish and 4,000-ish hertz, then, multiples, then you can say this is a harmonic spectrum. And if you took such a sound and looked at it as a signal in time, you would see a repeating waveform. So there's this great fact about repeating waveforms, which is if you look at their spectrum, you will see a harmonic spectrum, and the frequencies present in the spectrum will all be multiples of a frequency, which is the fundamental frequency, which is one over the period of the repeating waveform. Okay, and that's, that's acoustics. When you... Oh, and for, for interesting reasons, both a, a, a cylindrical air column and a string stuck between two things turns out to make harmonic spectra because, miraculously enough, uh, the modes of vibration, in the, uh, the various modes of vibration of either an air column or a string are all multiples of the fundamental. Okay. Integer multiples, right? Oh, thank you. Integer multiples, not just multiples. Yeah, I probably have been saying multiples meaning integer multiples all day. <laughs> This is why you need two mathematicians in a room. Uh, the, the mathematician's worst enemy is, is um, uh, unstated assumptions. All right. Inharmonic spectra are spectra whose component frequencies are not describable as multiples of, of a, a integer multiples of a good fundamental. And that would be typical of, say, a metal object that you whack and it vibrated, a metal bar or a bell or that sort of thing solid vibrating objects that aren't strings, I guess, tend to have this effect. And bells, you can... Okay, so you saw, you saw a patch that imitates a bell, the Rese bell patch. And if you looked at those frequencies, the 0.56 and the 1.4, I think, that those are not all multiples of... Or integer multiples of one good candidate for a pitch. And so, as a result, you hear an inharmonic sound. You can ascribe a pitch to it, but it's a different thing from a harmonic sound. And if you looked at it in time, you wouldn't see a repeating waveform. Okay. So spectral envelope just, just uh, spectral envelope is a hand waving term that just describes the shape of the thing. And then in the shape, you can color it in either with a harmonic or inharmonic discrete spectrum or with a continuous spectrum. And that's not a complete description of sound by any means, but that's a working description of you know, sort of a first layer of, of distinctions that you could make between different large classes of sound for making brutal distinctions. Questions about this? Yeah. In harmonic, you're not talking about enharmonic, right? Oh, what's the... You talk about enharmonic, enharmonic means not harmonic, right? Yeah, and enharmonic, I don't know what it means. I ought to. I mean, it, etymologically, it means... It, it, it's like talking about transposition, you know, yeah. it's like C sharp and D flat. Yeah. Those are anharmonics? Oh, Ian. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm from Tennessee where we don't make differences in pronunciation between Ian and I-N. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. 
So yeah, I don't know about that term at all. That's a music term, and I'm I don't have a license for talking about that kind of stuff. So harmonic just means it's not harmonic, right? Yeah, yeah. It just means not harmonic. And then there's anharmonic, which means doesn't know about harmonicity. I don't, but I'm not sure how you're supposed to use that term, so I stay away from it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's there's that. Now to go. Uh, actually, let me stay here. And now using that language, I think I have to go to the next thing. I'm just gonna I'm gonna skip the equations and reach for another picture. Yeah, not that picture. This is stuff that I just described to you uh, being shown in a, in a good texty way as opposed to a demonstrative way. This, this is, this is uh, non-moving pictures that just show peak splitting because of multiplication by sinusoids uh, in, in all the cases. Okay, but what I really want to do is get down to this picture. Yeah. Here now is a way of thinking about what happens to both the frequency content and the spectral envelope of a sound when you ring modulate it. Okay, so we're taking a sound here, uh, and, I'm, and for the sake of argument, I'm, I'm starting with a harmonic sound, but I'm not assuming that, and I'm not assuming that the sound doesn't have a zero frequency component because that might be a useful thing to have in the sound. And any, anyway, some things will get it regardless of whether we wanted it there or not for reasons that will show up later. Okay, and now we will take that and multiply it by a nice sinusoid with a low frequency. Low uh, frequency that's small compared to the fundamental frequency of this harmonic sound. And this is now showing the spectrum of an imaginary harmonic sound, right? So then what's going to happen is, uh, let's see. So, all right, so this peak turned into that, oh, sorry. This peak turned into that peak. This peak turned into these two peaks here, there and there. This one turned into these two peaks here and here. This one turned into these two peaks, and this one turned into these two peaks. And then, either to clarify or to obfuscate the matter, I'm not sure which, I tried to draw a spectral envelope through all the peaks that wraps around through zero frequency. In other words, the peaks that were going down, I drew one part of the curve th through, and the peaks that were moving up, I drew the other part of the curve through. In order to describe really the, or in order to try to represent really the fact that what we're looking at is just the positive frequency portion of a thing which has negative frequencies as well, but happens to have symmetry about the zero frequency axis. But we can see that although we lost amplitude here, uh, well, we lost amplitude, but we also got extra peaks. And you could make, you could talk about the power and blah blah. That, that that'll come. But by and large, the spectral envelope of this is is something like a constant times the spectral envelope of that. And we could argue about whether this spectral envelope should be regarded as a half of this one or just equal to it because there are more peaks here and nobody will ever tell you whether throwing a whole bunch more peaks into something should mean that you should make the spectral envelope look higher or not. No one knows how to talk about that. Spectral envelope is a completely imaginary concept, only useful for trying to make descriptions like this. And the good thing about this way of representing it is that it works when you start talking about modulating by or making the modulating frequency be very high. So the thought experiment here is that we're taking this signal and multiplying it by a sinusoid, exactly as in the, as in the working patch that I showed you. And now we'll make the sinusoid that we're multiplying by be so high that it's actually higher than most of the peaks in the original signal. So here's the modulating frequency here. This is the thing that DC turned into. And this first partial turned into these two. Now that was these two, but as we push this thing further up, this one got pulled into zero and bounced off it, and now became two positive frequencies. And furthermore, this thing pulled most of the spectrum with it, except for this very last peak, which is still, this peak here still hasn't wrapped around through zero, as some people say, but it's still positive. So now what we have is 
a radical change in the spectral envelope. We took the spectral envelope, but thinking of the spectral envelope as being a, uh, as, as, as extending into negative frequencies as well as positive frequencies, we're taking the entire spectral envelope and hauling it out into some different place. Furthermore, if this modulating frequency happened to be chosen to be a multiple of this fundamental, then all of these peaks would land on multiples of the fundamental too. And again, we would get something that had this as a fundamental. It just would have a radically different spectral envelope, which would be the spectral envelope unfolded and then pulled out. All right? And that is why that thing sounded the way it sounded. That thing being over on this other page. That's what's happening when we're doing this. Whoops. This, this. What we're doing now is we're taking this signal, which has whatever spectrum it has, and we're multiplying it by something whose fundamental frequency is seven times the original fundamental. That's pulling it way out into high frequency land, and meanwhile, now we're hearing it in its mirror image. All right, and you can do this with anything. Uh, yeah. Questions? Oh, right. The other thing about that is, here's the waveform. If you, uh, if you want to see that, let's see. This waveform also does the right thing as you multiply by, here's a low one, and here's a very high one. As you multiply by a faster and faster sinusoid, our original thing, which looked like this, turns into a more and more wiggly waveform, which is also constant or in agreement with the fact that we're hearing progressively higher and higher frequency content, even though we're not really hearing this pitch as such, the pitch of this frequency. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, but that's not a frequency. That's a, uh, that's, yeah, that's an amplitude. So, oh, right. So here, why do you see things below there? It's because we're multiplying by this oscillator that ranges in value from plus to minus one. And so these large negative values are when the original waveform was up high, but then got multiplied by minus one. So this is minus 0.2, which is getting multiplied by this sinusoid, so it's ranging from minus two to positive two, because this is ranging from one to minus one. All right. This is stiff medicine, I know. Okay, but if you get but if you get your head around this stuff, then you can make all kinds of cool sounds. So it's 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 good to be able to, um, as a not quite a slight aside. Okay, here's a sound. Uh, if I happen to choose not, oh, let me go back to let me go back to one ten. All right, here's this sound. What would happen if I said not one ten and not two twenty, but halfway between them? which would be 165. We, it goes down an octave. Oh, let, me, let me graph it for you. What now is going to happen is that every other waveform of this is going to catch this being negative what it was before. And as a result, it'll be whatever it is followed by itself upside down, followed by itself right side up, and so on. And one way of thinking of that is that it then has twice the period because you have to wait for the right side up one to repeat, which takes twice as long. So that would explain why the pitch went down by a, an octave. So here's the original, and here's that. And furthermore, over here, one can explain that by... It's kind of cool. <laughs> let's, uh, let's make this eight. So here's the original sound, and here's the sound being ring modulated by something a, an octave below, that's to say half the frequency. And now we got, not only did we get the thing down an octave, but uh, we got a thing that only has odd harmonics. We have 
one half and three halves and five halves and so on times the original frequency. Because each peak, the, the peak that was one times the original peak frequency became 0 0.5 and 1.5. The next one became 1.5 and 2.5 and so on. And all those sidebands crashed into each other to give you, again, the same number, well, the same number plus one of partials as we had originally. Roughly the same spectral envelope because we were remodulating by a relatively low frequency and so because of this picture, we didn't change the spectral envelope very much, but we changed the placement of the partials and in particular, as a special case, we replaced the partials with ones that are placed at an octave below but odd harmonics. Right. So that's a thing that you can do with ring modulation. If you only knew what the pitch of someone's voice was, or the frequency of someone's voice was, fundamental frequency, then you could divide that by two and multiply it by their voice and you would drop their voice down an octave. And you would roughly be um, respecting the spectral envelope of the original voice. All right. So since that's a good thing to be able to do, let's do it. That actually shows up in, one, in another one of these examples. Do I have the browser still? Oh, is this it? Yeah, this is the example right here. So, with apologies, here's uh, our favorite radio announcer. Oops. Get rid of this. Shut up. Uh, let's get rid of this now. Okay. Uh, all right, now continue to soften and relax and can come back. Okay, I haven't told you about this, but there are, ooh, that's the old one, there are, there are objects in PD that will try to determine the pitch of sounds. One of them is called fiddle. Um, oh, looper, yeah, this is just a sample looper, just like you know about. There's, this, there's the sample, we've got a phaser. I'm not even doing anything special, I'm just multiplying the phaser by 44, 100, and then reading the table. Be very <laughs> sloppy. And then we're hearing this. And then if we take that and figure out what its pitch is using the wonderful fiddle object, um, and by the way, maybe we should, uh, this is pitch and amplitude pair, uh, there's stuff to do here that I would have to describe fiddle to tell you how to do in detail, but you get the help window for fiddle and see it. But anyway, it's pitch and amplitude pair, so we'll unpack to just get the pitch. Then we'll use Moses to get rid of thing, get rid of pitch estimates that are zero because that meant it just failed to find the pitch altogether. And then we have a nice number which we can convert from MIDI to frequency and then we can multiply it by a half. So that's, so you take the fundamental frequency of something and multiply it by a half here an octave down. And then that can be the frequency of an oscillator that we will multiply by the radio announcer. And then I, just to make it louder, I multiply by two and then you get this. Right. So here's the original. And here is the octave down but only on harmonics. And then if you want the whole thing, you add them together, and then you get them. Now, this is, the funny thing about this example is the, the fellow's voice actually goes all the way down to 50 hertz anyway. <laughs> so, the, uh, so first off, we're giving fiddle a real workout, but second, um, the, the, the frequencies that you're coming out or that you hear coming out could be going down to 25-ish hertz, which are just monstrously low, even, um, even for this guy. Okay. The other uh, thing to note, okay, so, so the general rule is multiply by oscillators with relatively low frequencies, you maintain roughly the spectral envelope but change the cars, the component frequencies. And as a, um, oh, and as a result you heard the same vowels coming out as original. You can, it's intelligible speech still, or sort of, I, mean, I don't know how you, I'd have to give you some real speech so, be, so you could decide whether it's intelligible or not because we've heard that so much that who knows what it is now in your ears. But at any rate, uh, it, w it would be intelligible speech if you put intelligible speech in uh, because the spectral envelope is roughly, uh, roughly speaking preserved by multiplying or ring modulating by a relatively low frequency sinusoid. It didn't move things around very much in distance, but it changed the component frequencies. The other thing, or another thing that you can do is say, okay, let's just multiply him by 
an oscillator that is 15 times the fundamental frequency. And now what that'll do is that'll take whatever he's got and throw it up into, well, so if he's going at, he's ranging from 50 to 80 hertz, so that times 15 is 15, yeah, something like a kilohertz to 1500 hertz. That's taking all the nice, those nice low frequencies in his voice and turning them into things that aren't low frequencies. Okay, and then you get this. You turn the original off. Right. So now you can get not exactly chipmunking, but aliasing. And still, you can sort of persuade yourself that you hear the same pitches. And actually, this is this is also good to add to the original. You can get, you get this sort of monstrous this, something that I don't know. This is the sound of someone talking through a paper plate or something like that. Okay, so that's yeah. So is this how the octave dividers from like the sixties, the pedals that they had back then? Uh, I'm not did sure about this, but I think what they did was something simpler, which was they assumed that the incoming sound was a sinusoid and they put it through a triggered flip flop, a D flip flop. Uh, and that would be electronics. It doesn't work as well when you do that. But on the other hand, if the guitarist is very careful, you can get it to behave okay. And there's a wonderful solo in Led Zeppelin to prove it. Yeah, this works much, or this, this is much easier to get to work than that would be. And if you've tried any of those old pedals, you'll know what I'm talking about. Oh, another thing to add is, that, uh, this only works with a monophonic signal. If I gave this a signal that had two different pitches in it, as if, for instance, if you played two strings on an instrument together, this wouldn't be good for dropping that by an octave. For this to work, we're assuming that the signal coming in is periodic, or almost periodic. Otherwise, it'll do something else. Hmm. Yeah. To put it another way, it's a perfectly linear process. So it'll, so to two strings, it will do exactly what it does to the individual strings added up, except that the, you have, you gotta choose one pitch to modulate it by, and which of the two pitches of the strings are you gonna choose? So you can, you can get one of the strings to go down an octave, and the other string turns into something else. Okay, so that's, uh, that's just a sort of a cheap thrill with ring modulation. Okay. Um, actually, yeah, so are there other questions about this before I go back to the original example? Yeah. Oh, why? Okay, so that's that's yeah. I can show you that happening here. I hope. Oh, wait. Let me t let me turn this off now. Okay. So now what's what's happening is as I as I increase the frequency of the oscillator that we mo modulate by, each of these things. Ooh, that wasn't a good example. Each of these things turns into two sidebands. If if I want this sideband to crash into this sideband and to superpose with it as one frequency. I would make this thing be exactly half of the fundamental, so that each one of them would come halfway over, and then they would meet. And that we do this way. Go oh, there. Yeah, you're right. Except again, now okay. So 24. Let's see. We're doing half integers times 16, right? So eight. 24, 40, 56. I can't do. Oh, 80 might be. No, 72. Yeah, there we go. 88. Okay. As opposed to the multiples of 16. So again, uh, ch oh, actually, changing this by a multiple of the fundamental, even, um, of the fundamental frequency will give you another spectrum which, which lies down 
on the same frequencies in some sense as the as the as the other. In other words, if I ch if I start adding or subtracting multiples of the fundamental of this, I'll make other spectra which line up with, with the spectrum I just got. And that could be the, the, the original frequency if these are actually integers, or it could be half the original frequencies if those are half integers, or it could be something else in harmonic if they were something else, like three. Uh -huh. Now I can, I can now make more spectra with these frequencies by adding 16 again, which is which is being normalized to 1, so then 35. 35 plus 16, anyone? 41? Oh, 51. Oh, thanks. Ooh, sounds better. 41 was wrong, right? 51's correct. Okay, and so on like that. All right. Other questions about that? Okay. Next matter. This will go on until <laughs> until we're done. I guess this this is going to go on for probably about four lectures worth. Okay. The next thing, but uh, I should say, there aren't very many things to do. There are just lots of ramifications of, of a very small number of things. So really, all you're doing, all we're doing anyway for 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 the nonce is taking oscillators, running them through nonlinear functions, and then multiplying things together and sometimes adding things together. So it's now perhaps time to go back to this original clip example and to, whoops. Oh, right, we've got this other thing on. OK, so go back to the original example here. And this is a clipped sinusoid. And by the way, uh, you know this already, but you can now get timbres by changing what you clip by. That's that's change, That's these waveforms here. So if you were smart, you could harness that to give you give yourself a collection of timbres, all of which are harmonic. And if you do it right, you can do you can start talking about things about like how what's the um, what's the relative concentration of energy in low versus high harmonics in a sound like that. And that might give you ways also of making qualitative changes that you would want in spectrum. Okay, so what happens when you do this? The only way of describing what happens when you do this that is easy to understand, well, there are two things that are easy to understand. One is clipping is distortion, all right, and that people understood perfectly well in the 50s and 60s. But the other thing is you can also think mathematically about what happens when you apply nonlinear functions to oscillators. And the simplest nonlinear function that you might want to apply would be simply squaring. So where we're going now is we're going to work ourselves up through two, into functions by just talking about polynomials. That's to say, the, the original signal, which is itself, uh, it, it squared, it cubed it to the fourth power, and so on. It turns out that it's very easy to analyze what that does to um, to the frequency content of things. And then if you get a more complicated function, if you can approximate it with a polynomial, then you can come up with a description of what the nonlinear function does. Furthermore, if you're smart, then if you want to do something, you can dream up a polynomial that might do that for you, and then you can make it, or make a function that it approximates, and then apply that function and get a, a desired effect. Okay? So what's, so, but we'll start out inductively by saying, Here's an oscillator. Uh, okay, I'm going to just save as now. Whoa, why do I have that? Anyway, three. More wave shape. Oh, yeah. More, I guess. So now we're going to just try the simplest possible thing, which is to take the original signal and square it. Now let's, okay, let's even get rid of this. So I can I can show you this and the clipped one and give you these for comparison. So to square something, all you have to do is multiply it by itself.
and then I'll do that and this. Now, squaring things does funny things to their amplitudes. Like, duh. So, if I took this thing and doubled it in amplitude, then after I squared it, I, it, it would quadruple in the amplitude. So, this is a thing which does not respect changes in amplitude. Well, it respects it in the sense of getting louder when it gets louder in some sense, but other than that, it doesn't doesn't do the thing that you would, might wish. It does something better. So here's the original uh, oscillator, which I want to graph for you. And now here is that oscillator squared. I'm going to make another of these so I can go back and forth between them fast. Okay, so here the period is, is about a half of the, of the table. And here, if I show the thing squared, it changed. It's still a sinusoid. Oh, I can prove that it's still a sinusoid. I, I can play it for you. Here's the original. And here's that signal squared. Isn't that interesting? And furthermore, this agrees with what we see. Here's sine. Here's uh, the sine of omega t, if you like, where omega is the angular frequency. And here is the sine of omega t quantity squared. Actually, let's say cosine of omega t quantity squared. There's a relation which says that the cosine of theta squared, cosine squared of theta, that's a half of the quantity 1 plus the cosine of 2 theta. That was algebra 2, I think, right? So everyone's forgotten it. It's a, it's a special case of, of the master trigonometric identity for computer music, which is cosine A times cosine B is a half cosine of A plus B plus cosine of A minus B. That's the thing that describes ring modulation, and it also describes what's happening here. You see that it, the half is the fact that it now ranges in value from 0 to 1. It's now 1 half plus a sinusoid of amplitude one half, and that sinusoid has twice the frequency of the original sinusoid. And the reason that it sounds just as strong as psychoacoustics is because your ears are much more sensitive to this frequency than, than to that one. It should, you know, at some other frequency range, it might sound a little quieter. 